for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. And Father, we just want to pray today, Lord God, we see in the life of Peter, we see ourselves in many ways, Lord. We see his strengths, we see his weaknesses, and Lord God, we see that, Lord God, he crashed. And Lord, it wasn't something that just happened by accident, Lord. There were a number of things that led up to this crash, and, and then, Lord God, we see that there were a number of things that led up to his restoration. We want, Lord God, today, wherever we may be, Lord, maybe we are in that place where we are crashing. Or maybe we're in the place, Lord, where we desperately need restoration. We pray, Lord God, that you would minister your word to our heart. Meet us here personally, Jesus. And have your way with us. It might be for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. <clears throat> the rise and uh, fall of, uh, of Peter. Jesus calls Peter. Uh, he's the head fisherman in Capernaum. And Peter is, uh, is doing his fishing thing when Jesus comes upon him. And uh, he calls him Petros. He says, your name is, uh, no one will be Simon. Your name is going to be Petros. Which means small rock. Or stone. And there's a real play on words with what Jesus is saying, Peter, because you know, when you're walking down the road and you kick a pebble, what happens to it? You kick it across the street. Jesus is the Petra, okay? He's the rock. And Peter is the Petros, but it really kind of gives us a picture of who Peter is. He's flaky, right? He's, he's very flaky. He's shaky. He's compulsive. He's reactive. He's inconsistent. His yes is not his yes, and his no is not his no. He doesn't mean what he says, and he, he doesn't say what he means. And he's not someone you can rely on. Have you ever met Peters in your life before? You met them in the church, right? So Jesus calls this unstable man to follow him. There's a number of uh, stories that go along with Peter. Two of my favorites are, they're fishing one day. Jesus is in the boat, and Peter's not catching any fish. So Jesus says, hey, throw your net on the side of the boat, and you're going to have a big catch. And there's Peter, the head fisherman from Capernaum, being told by Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, how to fish. And of course, Peter scoffs at that, but he does it anyway, and when he throws the nets in, they catch more fish than they could possibly imagine, and the nets start to split. Peter falls down in front of Jesus, and he says to him, Lord, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. And suddenly he realizes whose presence he is in. There's also the story of Peter when he's out on the boat, and Jesus comes walking on the water, right? He's the only person who ever walked on water besides Jesus, and he's the only person who ever saw Jesus in that life, okay? Looking up while he's drowning in the water. But he is that only man besides the Lord who walked on the water. But the thing that Peter is most lonely, uh, most known for is his denial. When I was a kid growing up in the Roman Catholic Church, I didn't know many stories, but this was one story I did know because my Aunt Jane and my mother were always telling me about Peter, who denied the Lord three times. And that's really what I came to identify Peter with. When I read and read the scriptures, I was, um, <clears throat> I was blessed to realize that there was a whole lot more to Peter than what was said, merely uh, in uh, him denying the Lord three times. But he denied the Lord three times, and I'll just say this, when you look at that story, it's important to see, this was something that the Holy Spirit really taught me, Peter just didn't happen to deny the Lord three times. Mm. I hope that you realize there were a number of things that led up in Peter's life that eventually led to that crash. But somebody doesn't just suddenly deny the Lord, right, out of nowhere. Somebody doesn't just suddenly fall away from God. There were a number of things that led to Peter's crash. And there were six essential steps that led down. I want to look at them today. Now, after he crashed, there were three steps that led him back up. So I want to look at the six steps down and the three steps up. So let's begin with the six steps down. And uh, the first step down, number one, and we see this in the life of Peter, right smack in the middle of Jesus' ministry, Peter has a private agenda. He has a singular agenda. It's, it's, it's his agenda, not the Lord's agenda. He's following his will. He's not following the Lord's will. In Matthew chapter 16, 21 and 23, it says, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not as me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And that, that, that is it right there. He had 
a mind of the world. He had the worldly mind and not the mind of the Lord. He had the things of the world in mind and not the things of Yeshua in mind. His goal here was, you know, it, it was it was about him. Peter's, you know, it, it's his it's his pride, the pride of life, bragging about, you know, who he is and what he's done, and you know, as the scripture says, the lust of the eyes in First John chapter uh, two, verse fifteen. Now, there's nothing wrong with having goals. There's nothing wrong with having objectives for your life, for your family, for your career. But are they in accord with the Lord's goals? And Peter's goals were not in accord with Yeshua's goals. They were in conflict. He didn't get it when Jesus taught that when we are to pray, we are to pray, your will be done. Because it wasn't about the Lord's will in Peter's life. It was about his will. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't your agenda, Lord, it was my agenda. It was not uh, your will be done, it was my will be done. It was not your goals, it was my goals. It was not your purpose, it was my purpose. It was not your schedule, it's my schedule. It's my agenda, not Jesus' agenda. Now, let's well, just question. What is God's will for my life? What is God's will for, for our lives? And in... That question, and people have come to me for 30 years asking me, I'm trying to discover God's will for my life. There is a general will, if you are born again, if you are truly saved, there's a general will that God has for your life. Mm -hmm. And then there is a specific will. So God had a specific will for me being called to be a pastor, being called to plant Living Word Community Church. That was God's specific will for me. But there is a general will that we all share. What is it? Well, I mean, let, let's, let's look at to be saved. And what does that fully mean? There is one specific thing that we are all called to concerning the will of God. And this is his agenda. And that is to know Jesus. To know him. That is what it is to be saved. It is not to go to church. It is not to have somebody pour water over your head. And it, it is to truly come into a relationship with Jesus and know Jesus. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know the Father, essentially through the Son, because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He said, for he who has seen me has seen the Father, I am the Father are one. To know Jesus is to know the Father. He said, if you don't have me, you don't have the Father. And if you think you have the Father without me, you're wrong. He said that over and over again in the Gospel of John. And the word there, to know, is the word genosco. I was blessed when Samuel was teaching the other night. He kept saying, Pastor Frank talks about genesco. Pastor Frank talks about genesco. It's a key word to understanding the scriptures. And what it means is to know in relationship, to essentially to, to have an intimacy. It, it comes from the concept of a husband and wife knowing each other. Right, you know your wife better than you know, you know anybody else. You know your husband better than you know anybody else. And you share an intimacy there that, that has not been shared with any other human being. And it's the concept of romance. Abraham knew Sarah. Isaac knew Rebecca. Right? Jacob knew Rachel. And they had this deep, intimate relationship with each other. To know the Lord, to have eternal life, is to have this intimate relationship with God. It's not religion! <laughs> which is what's basically being proclaimed in what they call churches all over the world today. It's to know him. Not to obey a bunch of ridiculous man-made rules. Or to think because you walk into some stone building that you're seeing. It's to know him. To have a relationship with him. When God created Eve for Adam, right, he created them man. And you have male and you have female. And when he created Eve, he took from Adam's side. It says he made an incision in his side. And he took from that this material, probably DNA, to create Eve. And I don't know about you, but this is one of those passages that's tough to wrap your mind around. Right? He took the rib. And it's hard to wrap my mind. I find it hard to wrap my, my mind around that passage. And I've studied that passage for years. And... It wasn't until recently I began to really understand that, you know, again, everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of Yeshua. Right? You will find the gospel concealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. I would say, always know the New Testament, and then you will know the Old Testament. 
So the picture here is that there is this incredible foreshadow that is very relative to us and where we stand today in our relationship with the Lord. It is a, a typology, a prophetic typology. And what you see here is something incredibly beautiful being played out in a bride from his side. A bride from his side. A bride is taken from the side of Adam. Paul calls Yeshua the second Adam. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What came from his side? What came from Yeshua's side? It's kind of it's kind of one of those old we talk about the nails, we talk about the cross, and I think a lot of times we miss that that there is something deeply significant. Well, you know what? The the Roman soldier took the spear and he stuck it in Jesus' side. Side and what flowed blood and water? Well, where did that blood and water come from? Where did it come from? His lungs. Yeah, I believe I believe where it came from was his heart ruptured. Mm -hmm. I believe Jesus ultimately he gave up his spirit. But at that point, his heart broke, and there was the pouring forth of, of blood and the water from his heart. That culminated things, finished things. He's dead. He died. For who? His bride. He had died for his bride. We we are his bride taken from his side. Mm -hmm. Ever think about that? We are his bride taken from his side. A heart that was broken by our sins and for our sins. A heart ruptured and <coughs> burst forth his love his grace, his mercy, and when that spear pierced his side, that, pain, that blood and water just flowed out. It's the blood and water of his love, of his life that he laid down for us. But we are, we are his bride that's taken from his side. In 1 John chapter 5 or 6, sorry, John begins his epistle by talking about how the life appeared and we have seen it. We, we have held it. We have witnessed it. He says we have touched it. John is saying, I, am, I, am, I, I, I testify to you that I am a direct witness of the life of Jesus. And John is the only one at the cross of the apostles who witnesses the piercing of Yeshua's side and this flow of blood and water coming from it. And then in the fifth chapter, verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is true. Mm -hmm. he's, saying, he's saying there's something significant about this act. A bride from his side. And what happened in the garden thousands of years before, when God created a bride for Adam from his side, so in the death of the Lord, there is a bride that has come from his side. Day is coming very soon when he's going to come for his bride. We are the bride of Christ. The Jewish, the Jewish wedding ceremonies had a, had a period of, of, of things that would happen. One of them was you first had the wedding arrangement when they were little children. Do you know what? If you are in Yeshua, then it has been arranged. Your wedding has been arranged. It usually was done when they were little children. I'll say this. The arrangement of you being married to Yeshua was done before the creation of the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the engagement occurred when you gave your life to him. What does the scripture tell us? We are engaged now to him, and we have the ring, the engagement ring. What does scripture say the engagement ring is? Mm -hmm. They taught this last year to the ladies. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the token. He's the deposit that the Lord has made just so that we would be sure that we, we know that we know him. And he gives testimony with our spirit that we are children of God. The actual wedding will take place when the Lord he comes for his bride. The rapture of the church. He takes us away and in Revelation 19 then you have the wedding feast. <laughs> and for the rest of eternity we are in Genosco. We are in this romance, it's a dance. A bride taken from his side. It's about relationship. That, that is the ultimate purpose for your life. To know him. To be in relationship with him. Above, above everything else. I'll give you one other key, key component here to this 
concept of what is the ultimate will for God uh, in our lives, and that is to be conformed to Yeshua's image. To be in relationship with him, but to go day by day and allow him, the potter, to be sculpting us and shaping us. And Romans chapter 8, 29 tells us, to whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The word conformed is somorphous, to be fashioned and likened to him. That, that is his ultimate goal and ultimate objective and ultimate will for your life, that you would know him, know the Father, be in Genosco with him, and then him shaping you and molding you and making you more and more like Jesus. If you understand, too, the passage that appears before verse 29, and we like to quote it, especially when we're going through difficult times, Mm -hmm. right, we, like, we like to say, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, I just want to ask you this. What good? Right? Look at that. And we know that all things work together for the good. What good? My good? His good. Right? Is it, is it my agenda, my objectives, my goals? What good? What good? Jesus. Look, look again in the context of what we just read. Verse 29, to be, con to be conformed to his image. That's the ultimate good. To the, oh, I'm going through a really hard time, I'm going through a hard financial time, but God's going to work for my good and I'm going to be rich. That's not it. <laughs> you fool. That's not it. <clears throat> the ultimate thing that he's trying to do in your life, all these things that he, are happening in your life. Look, we, we left the garden. We live in a fallen world. Have you noticed? Everything that is happening around us, he is ultimately going to use for the purpose of conforming us to the image of his son. <laughs> that, is it, that is his ultimate objective. That we would be in relationship with him and know him, and that we would daily be transformed and being conformed to the image of the Son. Now here's the danger. When one loses sight of Yeshua's purpose, that ultimate purpose, to know him and be conformed to his image, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So when the world's agenda takes place and actually is more important than that agenda, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I don't care who you are, I don't care where you come from, you're in trouble. That's a danger sign. And that's what Peter, that's really the beginning of Peter's downfall. Second. Second, second, second verse 31 to 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I, I tell you, Peter, the rooster uh, shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times. Uh, that you know of me. And in Matthew chapter 26, 31, 35, let me amplify on it. Peter answered and said, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. You know what, you know what he's saying there? I'm better than all them. I'm stronger than all them. I'm more spiritual than all them. I have greater faith than all them. I'm tougher than all them. I'm smarter than all them. He's so full of himself. He's so puffed up in himself. I mean, you know, he just, he's, he's overweened. You ever hear that term? Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the rest of the disciples standing behind him. So it tells us in, in Proverbs chapter 16, 8, pride comes before the fall. And Peter's heading for a fall. He's full of himself. He's puffed up. He's overconfident. He's supercilious. So here's a danger. The second danger here is when we think we can't fail and are stronger than we actually are, when we think we are more spiritual than others and better than them, you're in trouble. You're in danger. Third step. Is mm. So verse 45 and 46, when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. But they're simply they're sleeping instead of praying. 
Again, amplified in Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 and 41, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. When you neglect prayer, you become weaker. Let me say this, the less you pray, the weaker you are. The less you pray, the more vulnerable you are to the enemy and to temptation in the world. Prayer is the link that uh, connects us with God. When you're neglecting prayer, essentially here, I mean, you can come and worship here. You could come and read the Word. You could read the Word at home. If, if you're not doing it prayerfully, you're not connecting with God. And people go, people go to church all the time. People go through, they just go through the motions. But they're never really connecting with God and experiencing God. <clears throat> If you neglect prayer, Martin Luther said, for a single day, I should lose a great deal of the fire of faith. That neglect of prayer will limit us with that Holy Spirit fire, that passion that God gives to us. <coughs> Martin Luther, great leader, said it will diminish. When you find, essentially, someone who is praying authentic, biblical prayers, I mean, they're praying in the Spirit. They're praying in the power of God. You will find that person is walking in the power of God. Prayer is the, the only means, I'm telling you. You can read the Word all you want. If you're not reading the Word prayerfully, you're not going to receive any power from the Word. And the Word of God is powerful. And you know this. Our name of our church is Living Word Community Church. We preach the Word here. But the Word is, is absolutely powerless unless you connect with the Word in prayer through the Spirit and faith. That's how we connect with the power source. God is our power source. The Spirit is our power source. But you will have no power if you do not connect with the Lord in the Spirit. Listen to this great quote by Billy Graham. I thought I'd throw this in there. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. And that's absolutely true. I don't even know if you can call them a Christian. Charles Spurgeon, he said, Neglect of private prayer is the locust which devours the strength of the church. Look at all these churches dying all around us. They're dying. If they're not dead over there, they've got 20 people on Sunday morning in church. Nothing going on there. They, oh, they have the socials, you know. They have the, uh, we're doing a garage sale. You know, we're going to bring, bring, in your, bring in your stuff and we'll, we'll sell it so we can make enough money to pay the rent on the building or mortgage on the building. But they're, they're, they're dead. They're dead. Churches don't have prayer meetings anymore. I got all these churches all over our area. None of them have prayer meetings. It's amazing. And if they do have a prayer meeting, it's usually attended by you know, four or five people. But prayer is the power of the church. I said this, when the prayer meetings die here, I'm gone. I'm gone. I just want you to know that. When people stop showing up here during the week to pray, I'm gone. Prayerless churches, right? They're powerless churches. So prayerless Christians are, are, are wimpy Christians. Prayerless deacons are useless deacons. Prayerless elders are weak, ineffective elders. And prayerless pastors become passive pastors who don't have the power to speak the truth in the pulpits. Prayer is, is the power source. But the danger here is when we neglect personal prayer and devotions and prayer meetings, that's a dangerous place to be. Mm. I've come to understand in this time of my life, let me tell you, I can be... I could leave the ministry and just go out and go buy a, a, a house in Pennsylvania on a mountain just go there and spend the rest of my life in prayer. I think that would be more effective than so many of the things that we do, prayer. I mean, so much wasted energy and so many different things. Just if we would pray, the power of God that would work in our lives, in the church. Step down number four, the power of the flesh. So you have a, a private agenda, a prideful man, Neglect of prayer, and now what happens is things start breaking down. Things start spinning out of control. Peter's losing control. His little world that he has he is concocted is suddenly crumbling, and the foundation is shaking. So what does he do? He relies on the flesh, the sinful nature. He relies on his cleverness, on his ability to scheme, lie, take things, right? We take things into our own hands. And okay, we got real problems and, and we're not receiving the power of God. So now we rely on the strategies of the world. So if you look at, at verse 47, 
it tells us, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. We know that's Peter. And Jesus answered and said to him, Permit this. And he touched his ear and healed him. I just want you to notice that. Again, Peter here is playing by the rules of the world. And he cuts this guy's ear off. And this is a, a Jesus touching his ear. And this is an open wound that Jesus heals. Sammy said it to me the other day. An open wound that Jesus touches and heals. And he heals the guy. I want to show you, I want to show you again and amplify this from John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheet. I will not, uh, uh, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Do you understand the question there? Mm -hmm. See, things are unraveling, and Peter is in this place where he's thinking that this isn't what's supposed to be happening. It is exactly what was supposed to be happening. But Peter was so far out of God's will, so far from understanding God's will, that he thinks again he's going to intervene in his sinful nature and his flesh and somehow fix things. He's just way out of God's will. And he, it's, this is exactly what was supposed to happen. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? You ever see people when they come to this point, things start, things start unraveling. Mm -hmm. The ministry starts unraveling. People's, people's, you know, the marriage unravel. All these things start to unravel. What do they do? They, they immediately reverse. Let's use the power of the world mm -hmm. instead of the power of God. Yeah. Let's get into God's will. Now let's stay in, in our will. Mm -hmm. We start conning and they'll steal, they'll lie, they'll do all kinds of stuff to try to fix what's going on. So here, here's the danger when things begin to fall apart, to resort to fixing them in the flesh is a very dangerous thing. Step down number five, parting from nearness. So it tells us in Matthew chapter 26, 58, where Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. I want you just to, to look at Peter, who the Lord took up to Caesarea Philippi, and that's to the eyes of the apostles. Who do you guys say that I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah. The son of Yahweh. And Peter was taken with the Lord into uh, those intimate places. He was one of the only three who saw Jesus glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. He was in the, in, in, the, in the very heart of the garden, one of three as close to Jesus, Right? Other than the, you know, the eight were left on the outskirts of the garden. And now, this man who walked so close with the Lord is so distant. People distance themselves from him. They'll distance themselves from his word, and they'll distance themselves from communing with him, from talking to him and hearing from him. They'll distance themselves from the fellowship. They'll distance themselves from worship. They get further and further away from him. Suddenly now, they don't hear him anymore. They don't sense his presence anymore. When they pray, it's like their prayers are just going up into the air and nothing's being answered. They're not experiencing that warm touch upon their hearts, that embrace of his love and his grace. and Their hearts start to go cold. Their prayers, again, become passionless. They just go through the motions. Do people go through the motions? I used to think that was just a Catholic thing, and then I became an evangelical, and I found evangelicals, we just fake it better, because we speak Christianese. Most Catholics don't speak Christianese. We can speak it, you know, we, we say all the right things, and we can look like we're doing the right things, but our hearts can be a million miles away from him. Right? So he's now very distant, and he needs to come back. Let me just say this, if you're far away from the Lord, a very simple principle that the scriptures lay down. Jeremiah chapter 29. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That when we will search for the Lord, and we will seek, not half-heartedly, not going through routines, not just saying, oh, we're showing up to church today. I don't want to show up to church, Lord. 
But when you're really, really seeking Him with all your heart, and you're willing to give up the things that are that are getting in the way from you and, and Him in that Genosco relationship. So Peter's heart is, is filled with pride. Mm. And God desires a broken and contrite heart. But you could be in church, and you could be, let me tell you something, you could be in church today, and the guy is going to go to that bar across the street later today, and drink 20 drinks, and walk out stumbling home, you could be further away from God than he is. You really can. And if you don't believe that, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were in church. And the tax collectors and the prostitutes who were coming to the Lord were far closer to Jesus than they were. So the danger, the danger is when you begin to distance yourself from Yeshua, his word and his fellowship, you're in danger. Those are five steps. Now watch. We just read the passage. Step down number six. Personal denial. I just want you to just, again, think of Peter's confession of Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, which was probably about a year before Peter denied the Lord. He said to him, again, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Son of Yahweh. And now, when he is faced in the courtyard with these accusations that hey, you were with him. He says, woman, I do not know him. In fact, the word there, woman, is young woman. It's like a 14-year-old kid. You were with him. He said, I don't know him. I don't know him. Man, I, I, I'm not one of his followers. Man, I, I don't know what you're, what you're talking about. And we have Right there, let me tell you, this is one of the great crashes or explosions of history. I'll tell you, I I think Peter's crash made a bigger explosion. Do we have not sound? early 1990s, if your name was Jim and you were a preacher, you were in danger. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. All I can tell you is, one, I mean, mighty men of God, mighty, mighty men, one of them who I thought, let me tell you, sometimes we put people on a pedestal, I don't know if I've ever put a man on a pedestal from the pulpit, but if I ever did that, I came close with this guy because I thought this guy, I thought his poop didn't stink. I mean, I'm telling you, his poop didn't stink and his nose didn't run, and I just thought he was like one of the most mighty men of God that I've ever seen. And I, 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 I'm not somebody, again, who follows a lot of, you know, evangelist preachers. I, I supported my pastors through my life, but I would go to Madison Square Garden to hear this guy preach and play the piano. I can tell you he was an anointed man of God, and when he crashed, Mm-hmm. But I just want you to know when he crashed, and the other gyms crashed. Mm-hmm. This didn't happen in a vacuum. This just didn't suddenly happen by accident that, that they were you know, caught doing the things that they were doing. There were a number of steps that led down to this happening. Mm-hmm. And we see that. We've seen it in the United States in recent years in presidents. Mm-hmm. We, we see it in college coaches and professional coaches, mm-hmm. politicians, CEOs, principals of schools. We see people fall. and It's not just something, again, that just suddenly happens. There are a number of steps down that lead to that, to that crash and to that fall. When I see people and I see them on that, those steps going down, lower and lower, and you see it as a pastor. You see it as a pastor. And suddenly they come to you. And, and they'll tell you that, that they got into some kind of trouble. I got a DWI. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've, been, I've been charged with a crime. I, I committed a, adultery. You know, I, I was charged with embezzlement by these some of the things that I've heard through the years. But it's not a surprise. It's not like I sit there and go, surprise! No surprise! I'm not surprised. There's, there's no surprise. Because you saw them move step down, step down, step down. You, see, you saw their agenda become more important than God's agenda. You saw the, the prayerlessness and you saw the pride. And these things, these steps down and down, and then suddenly the crash occurs. There's no surprise. 
I'm not, I'm not surprised. Because it was, it, it, was, it was expected. Because when you're traveling down those stairs, the crash is going to happen. So Peter crashes, and, and he makes an atomic bomb noise that is still being heard 2,000 years later in the church. Now, six steps down, three steps up. So the first step up is repentance. And in verse 61 and 62, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. I want you to, to notice, just I want you to notice a couple of things here. One is when Peter sinned, the Lord looked at him. What do you think he saw when he looked into the Lord's eyes? Yeah, sadness, grace. I, I think that what he saw Jesus doing, he was looking at him, and Jesus was saying, Hey, Peter, I know. I knew. I, I, I knew. I told you. I, I, I knew. I knew. What, and you know what? And in his eyes is the love that says, I still love you. I knew you'd do it. No surprise here for Jesus. He told them over and over again it was going to happen. He says, I knew you'd do it. But I still love you. Have you ever felt the Lord's eye on you like that? Mm -hmm. Some of you are shaking your heads. It's a beautiful thing. Just his, his, his eyes that are filled with his compassion, his love, his forgiveness, and grace. Mm -hmm. Second thing here about repentance is Peter remembered what the Lord said to him. Mm -hmm. Peter, you're going to deny me. <laughs> and before the rooster crows, right, three times, you will have denied me. Three times. Remember, remember, right? That I've said this to you. And Peter remembers that the Lord had said that to him. And you know what something else the Lord said? Before the rooster crows and you deny me three times, after you do that, he said, go and strengthen your brothers. In other words, I'm not done with you. You're gonna feel you're gonna feel like absolute crap. <laughs> You're going to feel worse than you've ever felt in your life. But I'm still not done with you, Peter. It's not over. And then it says, Peter went out and he wept brittle, uh, bitterly. You know what this is? This is a broken and contrite heart. Mm -hmm. It would have been nice if he had that broken and contrite heart before and didn't have to go through this, right? I mean, that's, that's I think, what the Lord would prefer than us having to go through uh, this type of explosive crash that if he had come to the place where he allowed the Spirit to break his heart, I think if he really had gotten in the presence of God, and, and again, true prayer, because I think that there's nothing, no person can bring you to this place. Really, no experience can bring you to this place. It's the Holy Spirit who brings you to the place where you have a broken and contrite heart. And that is where Peter is here. He's, he's come now to a place of repentance. The second thing here, step and step up, is return. He returns. Where did he return? Well, he went back to the apostles. He went back to the upper room. Likely, I would say, on Saturday morning, he goes back to the upper room. Now, how do we know that he's in the upper room? Because Scripture tells us he's there when Jesus appears on Sunday morning. He's there when, when Mary comes in and says, hey, you know what, the tomb is empty, and him and John make a run down for the, uh, to, the, to the tomb. It tells us in, in Mark 16, 17, that the angel said, but go and tell his disciples and Peter, you're going to meet him up in Galilee. So he's in that place of the church. He's in the Ecclesia. And that is the place of grace. That is the place of forgiveness. That is the place of acceptance. I want to say this to you. You will not find a true, a true spirit-filled, Christ-centered church will always be a church of grace. Mm -hmm. And today you have the political church, you have the... Um, you have the, the church that is compromised on everything and is filled with all types of uh, paganism and idolatry. There are many different types of churches that are out there. The true biblical church that is centered in Jesus and the Spirit will always be a place of grace. Amen. A place where people who have failed, no matter who mm -hmm. they are, will be able to come and experience God's forgiveness and restoration. And you will not find that, you know that, you will not find that in the world. You will not find that in your job. But if you don't perform in your job, what happens? You're fired. Right, you're fired. 
Right? You, you will not find it on the sports field. You don't perform on the sports field, right? You're benched. Your kids don't perform on the sports field. They're, they're going to be collecting sprinklers in their high knees. And, and you, will not, you will not find it, right? Sometimes you do not find it in the family. But you will, you will find it in the church. That is a dealing with the, you know, the church is at this unique place when we are in accord with the Spirit of God, and again, Jesus is at the center of our life, that it should always be a place of, of grace, where people can fail and still be loved. They can still be received and, and go through a process of restoration. I mean, a process of restoration. The pastors fail. I believe the pastor fails in adultery. He's out. And uh, he can get restored to the body of Christ. I don't think he should ever be in the pulpit again preaching. Mm-hmm. pastor commits adultery. I mean, leaders in the church, there's, there's certain criteria. There's stronger, you know, stronger things to hold a leader mm-hmm. responsible. And um, but again, he can be restored. I know a pastor out in, uh, in a loving church uh, out in uh, Colorado, a friend of mine attends the church. Crazy, crazy stuff. Wonderful man of God. 15,000 people in the church was at one time the head of the Evangelical Association in the United States. And he was having sexual relationships with his male masseuse. And it was a scandal. Right? The world loved it. They jumped all over it. Too. But you know what? That man is back with his wife and his children. He's been restored. Now, he's not in ministry. He's actually doing counseling to help people having sexual dysfunction. But God has restored him to the body of Christ. And that church loved that man. And he's the head pastor. An unloving church would have thrown that man out and stoned him. But he can't... He, he knows he's not, he's not going to be back in, in, in the pulpit. There was, a, there was a man here in our church a number of years ago, John Heil. John was in prison 10 years at Broadway State Prison, and uh, one of the brothers in the church was a friend of, Bob, uh, of John, and I began writing letters to John while he was in prison, sharing the gospel with him. And John gets out, and we're in a little prayer meeting upstairs, or, or what the prayer meeting looked like then, maybe about seven or eight people in a circle praying, and John comes in, he sat right down next to me, and all I can tell you is, I knew it was John. I never saw him before. But I knew it was John. And I didn't know he was getting out of prison that, that, that week. Mm-hmm. And he sat right down next to me. And I looked at him and said, John, he says, Frank. And we started just hogging each other and rejoicing in the Lord. And John began coming here. John gave his life to the Lord. And, and one of John's cousins, it was his cousin or his aunt, he called me up on the phone and she said to me, do you know the kind of people you have coming to your church? And I said, I, I think I do. And she goes, well, you've got a man coming to your church. He's a murderer. He killed someone. And she'd gone on and she started telling me about all the things he had done, the, the terrible things he had done and all the pain that he caused her. And I said, wait a second. I said, wait, 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 wait. I said, I, I said, I just want you to understand something. Let me tell you about my sins. And I started telling her about my sins. Mm. I started telling her about all the sins. And I told her about people that I crushed my fist against their face. I see one guy who I knocked down a flight of stairs. He fractured his skull. And I saw blood pouring out the side of his head. And I thought for sure I killed him. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't. Thank the Lord for that. Because I would have been doing time. Well, I can tell you is I began telling her stories like that. And as the woman was listening to me, she got really quiet and she hung up on me. <laughs> I, I did say to her, though, you don't understand that the church was never meant to be a museum of holy relics, but a hospital for people who were broken and wounded. She didn't, she didn't understand that. But Peter comes back to that place of love and grace, and it was hard for him to come back. Right? He had his tail between his legs. He was so proud and so, you know, so proud. He comes back now and says, God, I, I denied him three times. But there's something special that's happening, and Jesus said, to where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Where two or three are truly gathered, you have ecclesia, you have the spirit of the Lord there. And that is a place where people can be restored. The last thing, the third step, is, is the step of uh, restoration. And that occurs a, 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 a couple weeks later, up in the Galilee. Peter and some of the apostles are fishing. Jesus is walking on the shore. He waves to them. They don't really recognize him at first. Then he cries out to them. Peter recognizes his voice. Peter jumps in, right? He takes off his outer bar, jumps in the water, swims to Jesus. And they have breakfast together. Breakfast with Jesus, if you've never done it, it's a marvelous thing. I encourage you to begin to have breakfast every day with Jesus. There's nothing better than it. No, no, no better way to start the day than to start the day with Jesus. And no matter how bad you were the day before, all I can tell you is it's a new day, a new beginning, it's a new sunrise, and it's a clean slate. And when you enter with him, he gives you grace and all those things. Oh, no, it's healthy. It's healthy. Help you for our minds, help you for our bodies. But Jesus meets him. So three denials, and you see three words of restoration. John chapter 21, 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said, 
to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love? And the word there for love is agape. And this is a play on words. If you're reading it in English, you miss it because there are three words that are used in Scripture for the uh, word love. He says, do you agape me? That's the, the supernatural love of God. That's the love that, that the Lord puts into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Do you love me with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? More than these, more than your brothers around you. And he said to him, yes, Lord, I, you know that I phileo you. I love you with that human brotherly love. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And then a second time, he said to him again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you got me? Do you love me with that supernatural divine love? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then the third time, Jesus lowered the bar, and he said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileos me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? It's not just that he asked him a third time, it's that now he lowered the bar, and he said, now, do you love me with that human love? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know all things, you know that I phileos you, and Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. By the way, he thinks I understand there. Whatever love you may have, he will accept. Mm -hmm. And I hope you do not love him as much today as you will a year ago. And I hope you love him more today than you did a year ago. Mm -hmm. But they must say, we all have different, uh, different levels of our spiritual walk with him, or different levels of maturity. But he will take whatever love you will give him. And I believe he will ultimately bring you to a godly love. So Peter is restored. You know what's neat about Peter? He gets filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that, that's the, the major transformation and change. Then he is filled with the very power of God on Pentecost. He stands up in front of the crowd, he's no longer afraid, and he proclaims the gospel to them and preaches this beautiful sermon in Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 or so come and give their lives to Christ. The next day, he and John, they're going up. They're going up to the temple to pray, and there's this man, this crippled man, and they pray over him, and they heal him. The man's asking for money. Give me money. He said, I don't have money, but I give to you the name of Jesus of Nazareth, healing, and he's healed. He gets on his feet, creates a huge stir in Jerusalem. He's taken before the Sanhedrin with John. They're told that you are not to talk about this Jesus anymore. He says, who should we obey, God or man? He says, we cannot help but talk about Jesus. So they give him a beating and they send him back. Where does he go? He goes right back with John to the fellowship. And they get filled with the Spirit again. Acts chapter 4. He gets arrested and he's put in prison. James was killed the day before by Herod. Now he's got death row. He's going to be killed the next day. And he falls asleep. He's no longer so anxious and worried about everything. He has the peace of the Spirit in his heart. And he's sleeping between two soldiers. And when the angel comes and he says, Peter, Peter. Peter! Bang! He has to smack him on the side of the head to get him off. And that's what it says. He is a different man. And then you see Peter kind of fade out of the picture. And Paul takes precedence. We see him pop up there in the story in the book of Galatians. And we still see that there's, there's still a sinful nature in Peter. He pulls back. Starts to compromise in one area. But, but Peter, Peter is very different. And church tradition says that Peter would go to Rome and be arrested by Nero. And they would take him out and they would crucify Peter. And Peter asked, I am not worthy to be crucified, right set up like my Lord. So they crucified him upside down. And this man who denied the Lord three times in front of a 14 year old, right? Now God, a terrible death, fearlessly, courageously, in faith. He becomes the rock mm -hmm. that Jesus intended him to do. So here's our, here's our conclusion. Two, two things in, in applying, you know, again, today's mm -hmm. message. One is to stop and ask yourself and beware. Are there things in your life? Are you moving away? Let me say something to you. Some of you have been here at the church for a while, maybe other churches, and you may be looking at these steps down and saying, basically, this is just where I've been my whole Christian life. I've never really had an intimacy with Jesus. I don't have a prayer life. 
You know, just that uh, you, you're looking at yourself saying, hey, my life is more characterized by prayer and uh, pride than humility. <laughs> and, and then others of you, hey, maybe you were at a place at some point and you were really walking with him and experiencing that intimacy and that wonder that comes from walking through this life with Yeshua and now you look at yourself and say, you know what, I've kind of gone and just following my own agenda. It's my agenda. It's, it's other people's agenda that they're, they're forcing on me instead of it being true Jesus' agenda. Or maybe you're looking and saying, yeah, I've been you know, really prideful. Or you're looking and you're saying, I'm prayerless. I neglect, I'm neglecting prayer. Mm-hmm. Maybe there are things that are, that are going on in your life and you're looking right now and you're saying, hey, you know what? That's me, the power of the flesh. Mm-hmm. My conniving, my lying, my cheating. I'm, I'm just constantly manipulating the things around me and the people around me. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's just that crying of nearness, and there's no nearness in your life with Jesus. And maybe you're somebody you truly, yeah, you, 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 you have crashed. So look, at your, look at your heart. You know, the Lord gives us these examples. You know, again, I see this all the time as we're going through the book of Genesis. He gives us these wonderful people examples. And people examples are easier to relate to and connect with than merely just simply putting like a thesis in front of you or just like a, a commandment in front of you. We, we have an example here of what happens when we neglect these important things in our walk with the Lord and ultimately the crash that can happen. And if you're, if you're far off from the Lord, if, if you're in a place where you're not experiencing that nearness, maybe if you have crashed, then, then look at it again and coming back and following these steps, repentance. Let him break your heart. Take a look into his eyes and see what, what he is looking at you with. His love, his grace, his mercy. And return. Return to the ecclesia. <clears throat> you know, individualism. If you read his word, there's no place for it mm-hmm. in your relationship with him. That independent attitude, we're called to be a part of the body of the family of God. And then the restoration today. Let him speak into your life and leave you restored. Leave you like Peter did that morning up on the Sea of Galilee after he had breakfast with Jesus. Leave restored in your relationship with him. Mm-hmm. He's calling you. That's what he's calling you to. Our Lord loves you. Mm-hmm. He loves me more than we will ever know. Mm-hmm. And he wants us to experience that intimacy that can also that nearness with him. And if there's things that are in the way today, let the Lord fix that in our life and make it right. So would you all bow your heads with me and we'll pray. Father, I want to pray, Lord God, that you would just move amongst us today and have your way with us, Lord. There are people here, Lord God, who desperately need, Lord God, to get this thing right with you today. I pray, Lord God, that you would move amongst us. Reveal to us, Lord, where we are in those steps. Are we on our way down? Are we on our way up, Lord? Are we at the top of the ladder? Are we at the bottom of the ladder? Where are we, Lord? And that your spirit would be ministering to us today and have your way with us. Be for your glory and honor. Lord Jesus, come powerfully today. Mm. Come powerfully in these prayers as people cry out to you, Lord God. And they're seeking, Lord God, the nearness and the restoration. And just move amongst us. Let it be for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand with me? I'll open the altars for prayer.